I bought this guitar in about 2010 from Northern Guitars in Leeds when it was just a guitar shop. It's now a bar where they incidentally play, sell, sell some guitars on the top floor. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. And uh, I've got a mate who calls it Trigger's Broom, this guitar. And the reason why he calls it Trigger's Broom is it's had a new neck, come back to that in a minute. It's had a new bridge, I think it's a Schecter. Um, it's had a new wiring harness. Um, so the only original parts on it are the neck pickup, which is really important, the scratch plate and the body. So Trigger's Broom. Hello, so whilst Nick's jibber jabbering down below, we're going to demonstrate how we're going to mic the guitar cup cab for the demonstration on the Tele Custom. So what we're going to do is use the DJI Mic 2, recently launched. We're going to clip it to a mic stand, old school type, and going to aim it at the baffle of the guitar cab. So we may have to change the distance a bit because I would imagine this mic's pretty sensitive. As you know, properly know, is that these guitars, the Telecaster Deluxes, Telecaster Customs and some straps actually in the 70s had a three bolt neck plate. This hasn't, it had one, and actually you can probably see the remnants of it, possibly not. We can see me. Ooh. Um, I took the original neck off, so the neck was uh, I think a seven and a quarter radius, so one with a bullet truss rod, the original one, and I didn't take it off for any playability reasons apart from it had a few dead spots so it was fine to play rhythm guitar and you could get a few licks out of it, it had like quite thin fret wire uh, and I actually sold the guitar sold the neck for as much as I paid for the guitar so you know so I paid 200 for the guitar and I sold the neck for 200 on eBay now the reason why I'm saying this is most rock and roll guitar pre-internet days and you've got to remember getting information about what people played amps and guitars etc was was difficult in those days and i knew that keith our lord and master played one of these in standard tuning he never really used it for open tuning until much later on using the shiny light film and there's an album called love you live and i'm going to cut to me holding that up uh, that came out with stones came out uh, in september 20 uh, september 1977 i bought it i was away in london on a school trip and I bought it on that trip, I always remember, it cost a lot of money. I think it was like 12 quid in those days, which was a lot of money in those days. So I had Love You Live, Andy Warhol cover, and I assumed that the first few tracks on it that were in standard tuning, so I think this hot stuff, If You Can't Rock Me, Get Off My Cloud, Fingerprint File, um, Star, Star, or as we know it, Star, mm-hmm. Um, all that was done on this guitar. So I just assumed it was some esoteric Zematis or some Ted Newman Jones really flashy custom guitar. And it wasn't, it was this one. I didn't find out that out till years later when I saw video footage of those concerts that are on Love You Live. I just assumed it was something really out there. And of course, it's this thing. And the reason why I say that is the breadth of tones and bear in mind, it's a live concert with Ampeg amps screaming. Uh, this guitar covers in those tracks that are in standard tuning on the new live is amazing. So, back to this one. When I bought it, as I say, it had the standard three, two screw, one bolt, triangular neck plate. Now, I've seen loads of misinformation on the internet about this three bolt thing. There's, there's a persistent rumour that goes around that Lee Ayer Coco or whatever it was called that was part of General Motors went round the Fender factory and suggested to Fender which was now under CBS ownership that they get rid of a screw from the production and it would save them 10 cents and they could knock that on you know they could roll that over into the massive production lines that's total rubbish and I still see it nowadays it's more expensive to have a two screw one bolt neck plate because it's got a micro tilt mechanism inside so it used to have a, a piece of metal within the neck to bear down there's a version of it around today but it's four it's four screws and it's a more expensive thing to do but i took the decision that if i was putting a newish standard neck modern profile neck on it that was going to go to four bolt so you can see it's gone from the three to the four again i think i sold the neck plate for some ridiculous i think somebody bought it off for like 40 quid 
because for some reason in those days you couldn't buy them direct from Fender. So, neck got changed and you can see it's got an extra fret or two frets, extra fret, which is why it kind of slightly encroaches on the cephalo of the humbucker. And it's a modern radius, so it'll be nine and a half, nine point two five, and it, the modern style frets. So it's yeah, playable, maybe. I'm not like that, but you know what I'm saying. And then I think yeah, Fender machine heads, just a really nice neck, plays really well. The bridge pickup. Now I've got a problem here because I've worked on so many Telecasters over the years. I've lost track of what the actual pickup in here, in here is. So I just blithely thought it was a broadcaster pickup. It's not. Broadcasters have, probably can't see it, but broadcasters have flat pole pieces, as do um, Fender lap steel pickups, whereas this is staggered. It's definitely hotter. It's definitely overwound. So I think it's some version of a uh, Fender custom shop overwound, possibly 60s, pick up something like that main thing is it matches really well with this neck pickup so this neck pickup is a Seth lover so people will probably be aware that Seth lover was the guy at gibson that invented the original paint applied for humbucker that which we all know and love from les paul's then in the 70s fender who were then owned by cbs took mr lover over mr lover man over to Fender and he invented this pickup which was bigger than normal the original version was bigger than the normal humbucker and they had these pull pieces which I always get this name wrong I always call it Q-knife but it's Q-niffy so it's um, made up of a, an alloy of three different metals and the reason why it was so resonant in those days was it used that material for the pull pieces and I think Fender have recently brought that back these pull pieces are not the expensive Q Niffy, Q Knife, whatever it might be. This is a standard humbucker in a bigger case that's wax potted. However, it's a good sounding pickup. So one of the main changes that I've made is within the um, controls. I should be sitting back a bit really, shouldn't I? It's within the controls. So traditionally, when they came out of the factory, these guitars, I think it might even be the case today, that the, the pots were all um, 250 pots. 250 uh, resistance, 250k. Now, people are aware that they're more designed for single coil pickups, they work better, but not, not as well for humbuckers. So one of the things that I did was, um, I changed the wiring so that the neck pickup has a 500k pot in the volume and tone, and the bridge pickup has a standard 250. That works really well. So you get a maximum kind of treble out of the neck pickup and you know typical Telecaster sound so it's like a Les Paul layout isn't it so they've got the switch up here and they've got the four two volume two tone I changed the side jack by the way so that would have been the original kind of bucket shaped fender side jack I've changed that for a flat plate Les Paul type plate which loads of players do biggest change by miles wiring harness pots and caps, can't remember what caps are in, probably find out when we look under the hood, as they say in America. Original pickup, but now working way better, and a braided uh, braided wire switch. I think it's maybe a switchcraft that's in here, probably will be a switchcraft, we'll find out. So original body, which is um, some version of older. Historical note, so years and years ago, Alan Rogan, who's funny enough got one of these up for sale at the moment, which he says is Keith Richards played, um, did an article in, in International Musician uh, years ago saying, if you're looking for one of these, and this was before the reissues, the sunburst ones, because I think they only came in two colours in the 70s, the sunburst ones were made out of ash, and the, old, the black ones were made out of older, and his recommendation was to go for the older bodied ones. It is, no, it's not that heavy actually. It's got polyurethane paint on it, which I don't think makes a massive difference on on uh, electric guitars and it's had a few bumps and bruises over the years or road worn as the kids like to call it but it is in good nick so I think the best guitars irrespective of electrics are the most resonant so as we've said our Dark Lord 
Keith, he's not a dark lord really, he's a really nice family man. Um, Keith Richards played one of these for years, still plays it, I think mainly for, uh, he plays it a lot still on um, standard tuning, though it's kind of been supplanted over the years by, he's got a green telly that he plays. And apart from stuff like Gimme Shelter and Midnight Rambler that he did on Les Paul Juniors, I think he used, oh yeah, sorry, he used, he's got an, an ES355 Gibson that uses one or two things. This for years was his main standard tuning guitar. Now, when I was a young boy, um, the Rolling Stones played Roundy Park. I'm gonna do a video on that at some point. And I think I was possibly, it was 82, so I was 19. Uh, and I went to see the Stones, couldn't believe the Stones were playing in my back garden. It was billed as the final concert, can you imagine? 40 to 40, yeah, 42 years ago, it was billed as the Stones' final concert, and here we are, still at it. And I stood right at the front, I wasn't stood on Keith's side exactly, I was stood kind of in the middle. If I'd have known where Keith stood, because I didn't know in those days, I'd have been over to his bit. And um, apart from seeing them, the Stones really close up, I'd seen them a few times before, but not within spitting distance, literally, within spitting distance, by the way. Um, it was great to see them. So traditionally, when you watch the Stones, just like Jagger comes with, oh, it's Jagger, and they're like, Keith's here. Ronnie Woods, in those days, didn't know what day it was. Bill Wyman stood way over there, looking at the girls in the uh, photography pit. And then you clock Charlie Watts, and you think, oh, it's Charlie Watts there. And then, and Ian Stewart, and then, oh, he's playing that guitar, he's playing that Tully Custom. So I've got a really distinct memory, and it's, you know, memories, change and they're getting embellished over the years don't they about what happened but I've got a real distinct memory of standing with Keith off to one side of me but really close up the front I'm on the DVD by the way you can see me on the DVD and they played uh, Let Me Go which had been on a track on um, Emotional Rescue and my memory is it was super loud that he just looked me dead in the eye and played the intro to Let Me Go I might have embellished that uh, but I do remember the intro, which was played, maybe it's, open, it's E or A, right, hit in the chest because it was so loud. So flash forward a couple of decades, a lot of the bands that came up in the 90s, so you got your bands that were using the Beatles as their model, and you got the bands that were using <coughs> the Rolling Stones as their model. You got people like the Black Crows that came up, not so much Guns N' Roses because they had a little bit of hair metal going on but Black, Black Clothes for it really took the Stones and the Faces blueprint and turned it into what the Black Clothes do um, and the guy I'm going to put his name up below but I can't quite think of his name I think it's, it's one of the brothers isn't it who plays guitar he plays this quite a lot plays his guitar quite a lot on a couple he just do it in open tuning sometimes but there's a, there's a couple of songs where as soon as I hear it I know oh, it's totally custom you can just tell, and sometimes telecustom on the front pickup and in the bridge position. So why it's such, why I think it's such a good guitar, such a good versatile guitar is, there's a lot going on, as we know, with every Telecaster bridge pickup. They just, ugh, if you hit it right on a good day with a good amp, there's not much to touch it in isolation. Don't think it's the same for a Les Paul humbucker, because if you wind, you know, if it's not, distorted and you wind it down a bit it becomes a bit they're a bit nondescript when the wound back comment section is going to go nuts isn't it here whereas there's a bit more it's not depth exactly but a bit more character possibly to a, a, a telecaster pickup depending on the electrics when you wind it back neck pickup in isolation is there's a lot going on there because it's not as it doesn't have the sometimes mushy edge and woolly edge that a, a, a gibson pickup can have and again you know, comment section is going to blow up. You know, it depends on the wiring, depends on the guitar. There's a lot of high end to it. In fact, when Seth Lover invented the original um, pickups, these pickups here, wide range humbuckers, his target was to have a Fender sound, but Fender Plus. So the benefits of it being humbucker, which is obviously no buzz and things like that, no hum, but also, um, let's put the gigs on again, bit of extra fender sound but with a bit of extra and in fact there's a video the guy i'll link it below oh, i can't remember his name again it's friday can't, i'm really i'm bad on names on a friday which is the twin humbucker version didn't change the pickups worked on it he's a great guitar player by the way which always helps 
I'll link it in the in the description here, and I'll maybe even do a box to him here because it's a fantastic advert for the Squire version. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the God God knows what's under here. We're going to take the scratch plate off. I hope it's tidy, and um, we'll look at what's going on underneath. I'm sure there's a load of shielding and my name and phone number written on it somewhere. Uh, so you can have a look. We'll have a look at. We might even be, unlike, be able to identify what this pickup is if, if I take the bridge off. Uh, and then we'll do some playing samples and I'll also link to some kind of some tracks where it's really evident that this guitar has been used. It's a great guitar and my son, who's a professional musician, my oldest son, plays bass mainly, but he always says, we've got a, quite a few guitars, he always says this is, this is the number one and he's, you know, he's played them all. So... We love you. Doesn't have a name. No, it doesn't have a name. Don't call them names, really. Uh, unless I drop them. Oh. So I've remembered what what this what this base this bridge plate is. It's actually a Schecter brass plate, but I changed the saddles because the brass Schecter saddles, the individual saddles, they were too high for the neck radius. They didn't quite work. So these are uh, stainless steel ones. Just remembered that to get the scratch plate off, I've got to take the neck off, which I wasn't really planning on doing, but we'll do it for you. So that's where the original um, three bolt um, tiltomatic, whatever it is, micro tilt thing was. So it's a piece of metal here, sorry, like, like a big washer, that the middle bolt of the three went into so you could up and down it, loosen the front screws and up and down it a bit on here. So if you did do that, that meant that the back of the neck wasn't making full contact with the wood. And my view about going back to guitar resonance is you need maximum um, contact between the back of the bridge and this bar here. So I always make a point of sanding out these bits where there's been paint over spray and also be there, kind of rough up, rough, rough up the or key the bit where it joins the body because I think you want maximum wood to wood, can so to speak. That's one. So, big reveal. Be interested to see myself what's under here. Let's turn it this way. Oh, pretty tidy. I've just got my name in there, look. Here we go. Original kind of Cephalover switchcraft. Oh, it's not braided, the cable, but never mind. I think it is switchcraft though. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a look under this. Uh, I'm just kind of looking at this wiring. We'll have a look under this bridge plate in a minute. It first does something first. Oh, hello. Oh, look, I've written a little message to myself as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah, 215 500k pots. So the 500k pots there are for the neck pickup, if you can see them, and the 250s, as we said, are for the bridge pickup. So let's have a look under here, see if we can identify what this is. So, a big reveal again. Really don't know what that is. Maybe we can identify that. I think it's some kind of 60s overwound one, that one. Looking at that, enamel wire. So that's what's under the uh, bridge pickup. We should take those saddles off now, never mind. Right, we're going to put all that back because it's freaking me out a bit. Players grow, don't they? <laughs> 